Welcome back to the Hardware Box News Corner for a quick recap of this week's main news topics in the PC hardware space. Last week, we got a flurry of news surrounding CES with announcements from all three major PC hardware companies, and this week, well, it's a mix of everything, so let's get started. But before that, a word from today's video sponsor. Experience ultimate performance and get pixel perfect detail with the new MSI Optics MAG274 QRF QD monitor. Raise hell in game and soak in a blazing fast 165Hz refresh rate, stunningly quick rapid IPS panel with unrivaled color reproduction that topped our own gaming monitor charts here at Hardware Unboxed, all backed with NVIDIA G Sync compatibility right out of the box. Offering 1440p resolution at 27 inches in size, MSI really has set a new standard for enthusiast gaming monitors. If a gaming monitor could be described as coming close to perfect, this would be it. So learn more about MSI's new Optics MAG274 QRF QD monitor via the links below. Our first topic today is a bit of a weird one, and I wanted to talk about it first, despite falling more into the rumor category. And that's the report that emerged this week, claiming that NVIDIA will be bringing back the GeForce RTX 2060 and RTX 2060 Super before the launch of the RTX 3060 in late February. This one has been circulating and received a bit of attention this week, so yeah, I think it's worth talking about. This rumor originates from French website overclocking.com, citing a confirmation from several brands. The post claims that manufacturers have received GPUs from NVIDIA that allow them to make the RTX 2060 and 2060 Super again. That's basically the gist of the story, with the rest of the rumor article being what appears to be speculation. Some outlets seem to have transformed this speculation into fact, which is a bit disappointing to see, but basically Overclocking.com is saying that the RTX 2060 could be priced slightly above 300 euros, while the RTX 2060 Super would come in at 400 euros, so about the same price those cards have been selling at since mid to late 2019. There was also some speculation that these GPUs are only being reintroduced for OEMs to help them ship pre-built PCs in the face of a general GPU shortage, specifically for newer GPUs in NVIDIA's RTX 30 series. So I want to break down these things a little bit. For a start, the two pieces of speculation are kind of incompatible with one another. If the RTX 2060 line was being reintroduced purely for OEM systems, then it wouldn't be receiving a retail price for the general market. This report doesn't seem to make it clear what the expectation is, and obviously the two situations are quite different. Helping out OEMs by providing RTX 2060s for their builds when they can't source anything else is a bit of a different story to NVIDIA reintroducing old GPUs at basically their two-year-old launch price. The other major question that I guess I have is, did NVIDIA ever officially discontinue RTX 2060 series GPUs, or has there just been stock shortages for a while now? There were some rumors in December that NVIDIA had stopped production of RTX 20 series GPUs, but this was just a rumor. It wasn't an official statement from NVIDIA. If NVIDIA didn't actually discontinue it, and this is simply another supplier run of RTX 2060s, then again, that's a, a different situation. We haven't heard anything to suggest that the RTX 2060 series is coming back into the market in some big push, but we also didn't hear that it has been discontinued or phased out either. Usually older GPUs don't get phased out until right before the launch of the new parts and sometimes even continue on in the market beyond that launch, at least when supply is limited to begin with. NVIDIA continuing to manufacture and sell RTX 2060s for a little while until the RTX 3060 hits full steam would just be a standard sort of practice. The obvious issue here is NVIDIA selling $300 and $400 GPUs with worse performance than the upcoming RTX 3060, which is supposed to slot in at $330 US dollars, and the already released RTX 3060 Ti, which is supposed to be a $400 GPU. Of course, the 3060 Ti isn't really a $400 GPU right now due to price inflation, and the RTX 3060 probably won't be $330 either, but it would be a rather dodgy situation to raise prices on newer GPUs compared to what was announced, and then bring back old GPUs at the prices new GPUs should be. On the other hand, it's been virtually impossible to buy any GPU at all for the last few months. Let's say you were on a low-end GPU like an RX 570, and you wanted to upgrade to a new $250 product. There's no next-gen GPUs announced at that price yet, but even if you were content with something last-gen, you won't even be able to find anything. All cards officially in that price range are out of stock, so your options are third-party sellers looking to flog off GTX 1650s at insane prices, 
So continuing to sell last gen products for a short time in that market is a better situation than what we have right now, which is to get screwed even harder. Anyway, I think this report should be taken with a grain of salt for now. The GPU market is quite complex at the moment with ridiculous demand and supply issues all over the shop. So it's hard to get a full picture of what is going on behind the scenes. Unfortunately, it looks like the pain will continue for a little while longer. Nvidia has quietly launched a new GPU in the last few weeks, the GeForce GT 1010. This is a low-end GPU that should replace the long-standing GT 710 as a basic graphics card option for, you say, your home theater PC builders and others that just need a basic card with acceleration capabilities or extra display outputs. The card isn't available for sale just yet, but was spotted in the list of products you can download drivers for on the Nvidia website. The GT 1010, as you might expect for the lowest of low-end GPUs, is nothing fancy. It's a Pascal-based product using GP108 silicon with 256 unlocked CUDA cores, down from 384 with the GT 1030. The memory configuration is said to be 2GB of GDDR5, so at least for now it doesn't look like we're getting a DDR4 option, something that was made available with the maligned GT 1030. Power requirements for the 1010 are just 30 watts, so this should be possible exclusively through PCI power, great for systems that don't have PCIe power connectors, or for compact builds that just need low profile GPUs, minimal cabling, just slot into the PCIe slot, get all the power through there. There's no official pricing just yet, but as an indication, the GT710 sits on the market as a $50 GPU or thereabouts, often passively cooled. Meanwhile, the GT1030 starts at around $80, with neither GPU really being affected by recent supply shortages, as gamers aren't often in the market for something so low end. I think we can expect the GT1030 to slot in around the $50 to $60 range, which again, fine for basic use cases. Last week, we talked about Intel's new CEO, Pat Gelsinger, and this week, Intel has bobbed up with another major hire, that of former Intel senior fellow, Glenn Hinton. According to a post on his LinkedIn account, Hinton was retired for the last three years, but is returning to work on an exciting high-performance CPU product at Intel. He also states that having Pat Gelsinger coming back as CEO also helped me finalize my decision to come back. Hinton worked at Intel for 35 years and is best known for being the lead architect on the Nehalem CPU core design. Prior to that, he played instrumental roles in the development of other microarchitectures, including Pentium 4 and others. I think it's fair to say that Hinton was a key player during some of Intel's most successful years and had a significant influence on some of Intel's best products, so him returning to the company is quite a big deal. Obviously, we aren't going to know what this exciting high-performance CPU product is for some time, as it will likely be a long-term project, but it will be interesting to see what Intel ends up with in a couple of years' time on the architecture front. NVIDIA has quietly downgraded the requirements for their G-Sync Ultimate program. G-Sync Ultimate used to be the branding NVIDIA applied to the highest-end G-Sync monitors, usually with flagship panel specifications. Crucially, G-Sync Ultimate monitors had proper HDR functionality, usually with a minimum of Display HDR 1000 certification, meaning 1000 its peak brightness or higher, plus proper local dimming support. Up until recently, a monitor would need 384 zone full array local dimming or better to qualify, so we're talking the highest end HDR capable monitors and OLED displays. This was a great system for monitor buyers, as anyone interested in a proper HDR monitor only had to look for G-Sync Ultimate branding to know that they are getting some form of true HDR capabilities. As we've talked about previously, proper full array local dimming is an essential requirement for a good HDR experience with current LCD monitors. But as recently spotted by PC monitors, Nvidia has quietly downgraded their program and no longer requires full array local dimming to be branded as G-Sync Ultimate. The two offending monitors that NVIDIA has allowed into the program are the MSI MEG381 CQR and LG 34GP 950G. Both of these are only certified as Display HDR 600 capable, meaning they do not have 1000 nits of peak brightness, something NVIDIA explicitly listed on their website as a feature of G-Sync Ultimate in November of 2020. In December, the website was updated, replacing over 1000 nits brightness with just lifelike HDR, which is a totally meaningless statement in comparison. The other issue aside from just peak brightness is that display HDR 600 monitors rarely include full array local dimming backlights as it's not a requirement for that level of display HDR. In the case of the MSI and LG monitors, I believe both use edge lit local dimming, which is significantly worse than full array at producing a good HDR experience. 
This means that G-Sync Ultimate branding will no longer be a true indication of whether a panel will be proper HDR or not. It will just be as meaningless as other brand labels slapped onto monitor boxes and marketing pages. On the one hand, I get why NVIDIA has done this. LCD panel manufacturers have been painfully slow at introducing new true HDR monitor panels, stifling the development of high-end gaming monitors and causing buyers to opt for ridiculous 48-inch OLED TVs as monitors instead of having a more suitable option available. I guess NVIDIA are sick of adding just one or two G-Sync Ultimate monitors to the list each year, if that. On the other hand, G-Sync Ultimate was an actually good brand from NVIDIA to have because it did genuinely make it easier for buyers to shop for an HDR monitor. Downgrading its requirements makes it useless and will quickly be forgotten in the enthusiast monitor market. Display HDR branding has fallen down that path over time, with requirements that allow non-HDR capable monitors to be branded as supporting HDR. I don't like the idea of G-Sync Ultimate heading down that way either. In a break from talking about NVIDIA, ASUS have shown off a new all-in-one liquid cooler for your CPU that for some reason includes a 3.5 inch LCD panel on it. Because of course, when building a PC, the most important thing is RGB lighting, and the second most important thing is making sure you can watch movies on your CPU cooler. ASUS claims the ROG Ryujin 2's display is actually meant for custom graphics or displaying system stats, but you just know people will have, let's say, other uses for the screen. I mean, I don't even have to say specifically what they'll use it for, but I think you know what I'm talking about. It'll be used for that. Other than that, uh, it's described as the ultimate thermal solution for your gaming rig and is listed as coming soon. Now back to the NVIDIA news. According to Notebook Check and confirmed by KitGuru, NVIDIA will no longer be using MaxQ branding to describe different lower power variants of their new RTX 30 series mobile GPUs. Instead, all power configurations of the same model will have the same name. So an RTX 3070, for example, will be called the RTX 3070 laptop GPU, regardless of whether it's an 80 to 90 watt variant, which previously would be branded as Max-Q, or the full 115 watts, which was previously called Max-P. This is because, as NVIDIA describes it, Max-Q no longer refers to just optimizations made to the GPU. Instead, it is a system and platform level feature that features optimizations across various areas. Whisper Mode and Dynamic Boost, for example, are now part of the Max-Q umbrella, but neither specifically require a low-power GPU. In fact, NVIDIA says that all Max-Q features, which also include, say, DLSS and resizable bar, are available to all power configurations of their mobile GPUs. This shift in branding will make it much more difficult for buyers to know the performance levels they'll be getting from the laptop they are buying, unless the manufacturer is extremely clear on power configurations. Previously, you could at least see Max-Q and know you're getting a slower, lower power 80 to 90 watt variant of the GPU. Now you'll have some OEMs using an RTX 3080 80 watt and others using an RTX 3080 at 150 watts, but both will be called the same thing despite drastically different performance. You'll have some RTX 3060 laptops powered at 115 watts beating RTX 3070 laptops, which previously would have been 3070 Max Q configured at 80 watts, but now will just be called RTX 3070 laptop GPU. So that's a huge mess for buyers, and in my opinion, a terrible decision for consumers in general that effectively will prey on people that don't do research and will end up overpaying for specs that deliver inferior performance to a cheaper configuration. We've talked at length about how this whole situation is generally bad, and Notebook Check have done similar stuff. Basically, laptop reviews are now going to be as important as ever for diving into power configurations and features, as NVIDIA isn't giving you any help here whatsoever. Hopefully more OEMs will join companies like XMG and ASUS in being transparent about power levels, because right now the power configuration is just as important as the actual GPU name in terms of figuring out what sort of performance you were getting. So yeah, what a mess. Final couple of topics to finish out the video. Samsung has launched the 870 EVO, a new SATA SSD based on the company's 6th gen 3D TLC NAND. The 870 EVO is quite similar to the previously released 870 QVO, except that it swaps out QLC memory for TLC. So we're looking at the same Samsung MKX controller as expected, and a similar design being a 2.5 inch form factor. 
Samsung offering the 870 Evo at capacities between 250GB and 4TB, with the price for a 1TB model listed at $130, US so about $20 to $30 more expensive than the Qvo model. But of course, performance is higher, being TLC memory, not QLC, listed at 98K IOPS random read and 88K IOPS random write. There's also higher write endurance at 600TB for the 1TB model versus 360TB for the Qvo. These drives should be available shortly if you're interested. And finally, we have a report that Intel's 12th gen Alder Lake S processor has been spotted in the C Software database. While listed as just an Intel genuine CPU, it is seen to have a 16 core, 32 thread layout with 30 megabytes of L3 cache, higher than Intel's current processor lines. However, the listing of 32 threads is probably wrong, given Alder Lake is expected to be a hybrid design with 8 big and 8 little cores. Those little cores are not expected to feature hyperthreading. The CPU is also seen with a base clock of 1.8GHz and boost of 4GHz, although like most engineering samples, I wouldn't read too much into this given the early state of the sample. Alder Lake processors aren't expected to hit the market until the second half of 2021, and that could just be for mobile parts, putting Alder Lake S further away. Video cards of a photo of an Alder Lake S CPU showing the new socket design, LGA 1700, which is expected to bring with it DDR5 and PCI 5.0 support, so something to look forward to later in the year or potentially early next year. That's it for this News Corner episode. Um, if you're interested in these sort of news videos that we do from time to time, you can, of course, subscribe. And if you want to support the channel, we have our Patreon and Floatplane accounts. Links in the description below. You have access to all our monthly live streams, Discord chat, all that good stuff. You know all about the Patreon and Floatplane accounts by this point. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.